Welcome everybody. This is our Faber Climate Action Team meeting with Rosalie Dito, who will share about her native gardening for drought. And just a little about us. We're a local community group in Fallbrook, and we put on monthly presentations on Zoom the last Tuesday of every month with a local climate change expert. Local or they may not even be local, but um, somebody who can share their expertise with us on different subjects. And next month, we're going to have someone from the Scripps Institute um, talking about the oceans. So that will be a good presentation. So um, um, I, I, would, I did want to let you know um, that one of the things we're doing is we are, we have a little committee that's working on looking for more places to have cool zones in the Fallbrook Bonzel area. So if any of you are interested in working on that, then um, you can let us know in the chat room or respond to one of our emails. We had a meeting about that today. So we're actively seeking out more places. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rosalie. She would prefer that you keep your questions until the end. So just um, write down your questions or remember them and then you can ask them at the end. Thank you. Go ahead, Rosalie. Oh, hi. I, I am going, obviously going to cover native plant gardening. And I wanted to let you know we're, we're really um, making this local. Most of the, the photos in this presentation are from my garden or the neighborhood. Um, and all of them are labeled. So if, if later on, if you want, would like a copy of the presentation, you can look back. If there's plants you like, you can look back and the, the, the names will be underneath. So let's get started because we need to move fast. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to cover uh, the definition of a California native plant, why they're, why they're important, which ones do well in Fallbrook, how to plant and grow, where to purchase, you can't get these at Home Depot usually, and, and then where to find more information. Again, the, and this is my, the, again, this is my garden showing off the Matilla poppies uh, and showy pensamin and sage. Um, so for the purpose, there's a lot, there's different definitions of a native plant. But for the purpose of this presentation, we're talking about the descendants of plants that were present in California prior to European contact. So these are plants that are adapted to our local climate and soil and an entire ecosystem over millenniums, thousands and thousands of years. And they survived and thrived here without sprinkling systems, which is great because when a gopher chews through your sprinkling system, it is no fun. So this makes it a lot easier that they can survive without a sprinkling system. And there's a lot of reasons to, to plant native plants. And I'll go into this in detail because I'm hoping to inspire you. Um, they really combine function and beauty. As mentioned, they're drought tolerant. You have to establish them first in the winter and get their roots established. But then after that, they're, they're built to for dry summers and rainy winters. Um, they're uniquely adapted, as I mentioned. Um, they're essential to the food web of life. Um, they, and they support, as part of that, they're supporting the greatest number of diversity of native animal species. And many of you have heard about the book, The Sixth Extinction. So this is a little thing we can do in our backyards to help stop that. We don't, you know, we don't, this is one thing we don't have to call our congressperson about it or organize. We just go to our backyard and um, start helping our um, diverse animal populations by, by planting native plants. Um, they don't require, they require no added fertilizer that pollutes streams and rivers. Um, and they provide a sense of place, they say, 
hey, we're not in Texas. This is what California looks like. And it's a way to give back to the land. We take a lot out of the land with the food we eat and um, petro products and even gold and silver. So it's, gr it's a great opportunity for, for us to help our own planet and help us survive. Um, they're low maintenance, but not no maintenance. And um, there's the best part is there's over 7,000 of them. So I hope get, they get more of those these into Home Depot, but they're not really much, there's not much going on there right now. Um, and then when I talk about them not needing water after they're established, I'm referring to the, the Southern Oak Woodland Chaparral and Coastal Sage Scrub Plants. And those are the those are the ones that you will mostly see being sold by the native plant nurseries. Um, and if a plant's from a from a river area or a seasonal creek, those you have to water more. So those you want to stay away from. And um, uh, later on, I'll tell you where you can find out what the watering requirements are. Are mostly no watering requirements are for these plants. And then many of you. One of the strategies we've used in the past to combat water usage is we've planted non-native succulents. And um, they're great, but at, in terms of conserving water, but then again, they don't host our, and feed our native species. They definitely don't host them. You're familiar with the monarch butterfly that needs a specific, needs milkweeds to survive. There's a lot of species like that. Um, they're better, again, they're better adapted to our climate and soil. That's why you don't have to do amendments. And finally, um, they re reinforce California's uniqueness. And I just wanted to give you a little chart where I'm referring to how important these native plants are, even in our backyard. So basically, Doug Ptolemy assessed research and figured out that our, our parks and um, preserves and conservation areas just aren't large enough to stop the decline in, in the bird population. They've done some studies on this. And so he's he's the one that's calling out for us to put native plants in our in our yard, in our in our own gardens, because we can control what we have in our gardens and it will make a difference. So basically um, with more native plants, there are more caterpillars and more baby birds. Um, for, for terrestrial birds, caterpillars are the main diet for baby birds. Even the birds that eat from your bird seed feeders, they're, they're feeding their babies caterpillar and other larvae. They don't, they don't feed them seeds when they're at this stage that I've got a photo of some bluebirds at. at. And on the right is a, a an assessment of just shows how wonderful the data plants are at providing food for the food web versus so we've got oaks are stellar California lilac and California sages are just some of the great ones and then if you compare their reproductive value on the left and green with the red which is common house plants how much a better job they can do. And I have to admit, I still have crepe myrtle in my garden. So it's a process. <laughs> the crepe myrtle has a very low reproductive value. I it means not a lot of uh, Lepidoptera, that's balsam butterflies lay their eight. They're, they're, they don't eat it. They can't, very few, very few um, moths and butter, butterflies can eat the leaves. And when, when, a, moth or, when, a, when a caterpillar I should say the caterpillars eat the leaves, they're converting the sun's energy, the plant absorbed into energy for the bottom of the food web. Another thing I wanna mention is even bears, about a quarter of their diet is insects. So that just shows how important insects are to our food web, including the caterpillars. So that's, that's the uh, clarion call to action. And then now we're, to, now we're gonna have the fun part about all the all the plants you can choose from for your garden. As I mentioned, there's over 7,000 and you can find trees and shrubs, ground cover segments, whatever it is unique for your garden, there's a, there's a na native plant to fill that niche. 
Um, and here's, um, I, I just gave you a brief tree list of trees that do well in, in Fallbrook. Um, and on the left, if you need a, if you have room for a large tree, I have coast live oaks on my property that I'm lucky the blue jays planted. They make a great shade tree. And when you have rainy winters, they grow fast. Um, when they're young, when they get older, they don't grow very fast, but they grow fast. And then on the right, I've got a list of some smaller trees. I'm sorry, on the right, far right of my slide. And I wanted to just show, point out the beauty of the uh, redbud tree at Palomares House and Park in the spring. So the Western redbud has, the, has these beautiful pink flowers in the spring that could compete with any apple tree or whatever flowery tree <laughs> there is um, in the traditional trade. And I just want to show you some more tree options you, where there's photos, these others, you'll, you'll, if they're worth looking up, the fetal Fremonto dendrum is evergreen with maple like, like leaves. It doesn't drop its leaves, so it all it looks good all year long, and it rewards you with some, with beautiful yellow blooms in the spring. And the desert willow also has beautiful pinkish and also burgundy flowers that are trumpet shaped and amazing. So they're worth looking up. I don't, I didn't have photos, like, but I do have, wanted to show how a, a little scrub oak can act as a tree um, by the roadside. Did you set up screen sharing? And the, um, the, in the center is the, what we call the California lilac. Um, and this one is Ray Hartman can work as a pretty tree like this. And I, I think it competes well with our jacaranda and it's even, it doesn't lose it. It doesn't drop its leaves. So it stays green and shiny all year round. And then on the, on the far right is a walnut tree that's growing in my yard. And so that's not only beautiful, but we actually do harvest the walnuts. You do, you need a very good nutcracker. Oh, any, I, am I going fast enough or too fast? Any, any I think we're okay. Okay. That's then, fine. Okay, great. And then uh, here's a list of shrubs that do well in Fallbrook. And I wanted to highlight the Cianothus. That's a powerhouse. Um, the leaves are green all year, even in the hot summer. And again, you don't water these in the summer once they're established and it still looks great. And then it oh, rewards you in the winter season with these beautiful red berries. Um, and the birds love the berries too, and they're very good food for the birds because they the birds co-evolve with these red berries. And a lot of people use them for decorations. And then some more shrub photos just to inspire you. Um, on the left is South Coast Blue Cianothus, commonly called the California Lilac. And this particular one is, is useful if you've got a fence and you need a, a hedge along your fence because it only gets to be about five feet wide and it will get to be about eight feet tall. Mine's still pretty young, this one's three, three years old. So it, I'm expecting it to get up to the eight feet in a couple more years. And just walking in my neighborhood, I saw this beautiful Cleveland sage blooming in spring. And those are huge. They're like six to eight feet wide and tall. Um, then moving on to the smaller plants, they're somewhat smaller. Um, there's annuals and perennials. And, Annuals, most of you who are, if you're gardeners, you're aware of this. If you're newer to gardening, maybe you haven't heard about this, but annuals tend to have a one season cycle like our California, most of our, many of our California poppies, you, you put the seeds in the ground in fall, winter rub them in good, and the plants will come up in early spring and bloom and put on their show, but then they, they've done their work. They've They've gotten pollinated 
they're, they've, they've grown, then they, they produce seeds and their seed pods turn brown, they spill their seeds and then they all, most of them turn brown. And a lot, that's what happens with annuals. Um, the perennials live more than a year, sometimes three, four, five, ten, 10, and sometimes even 20. And so um, they're useful to, they tend to have, they also have showy flowers like annuals, and they're great for coloring your garden, particularly in spring and um, spring, summer, and fall. Mostly, I must say mostly spring, if, if you want to have summer and, summer and fall color, you, you need to pay attention to the bloom, the bloom cycle to get some uh, summer and fall bloomers in your garden. And then as I was talking about the annuals, there's on the far right is the poppy with bluebells. That's a great seed combo to put in your yard. And, um, the poppies and the clarkia, the, the elegant clarkia that I'm showing a picture of, those will readily reseed in your yard. So once you purchase your packet of seeds, um, you're, you're usually good. They'll keep reproducing and you won't need to buy more seeds. I haven't gotten my bluebells to, to um, seed in the guard, yard, so I'll just buy new ones, but buy new seeds. But just again, there's, I've just shown you a few. There's there's many many more animals that you can use to in, to get the flowers we all love in the spring and summer. And moving on to ground covers, what's great what's great about the 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 one on the left, Selvia and Mrs. Beer, is I took this photo August twenty second in in August. And it was like, it's the plants in full sun, which means it gets six to eight hours of August sunshine. Um, no irrigation. I don't, I, I water this when I put it in the ground. So no, it's got no irrigation in 2022, except for what rain, little rainfall we got. And it's just sitting there as green as ever. It's not one you can walk on, but if you just need a ground cover, it's low maintenance. You don't have to water it after once once you water it initially that first winter, and it, it can take take our summers. And the one on the left is great for shade. It's um, San Diego savory, and I have that under my oak trees and, and a sycamore tree. And that one sometimes needs a little more moisture even in the winter. Um, the other, the other ones, I'm, I just tried uh, something called Bacchus Pigeon Point Two. I have Seaside Daisy. That's a cute little low-growing plant with with daisy-like flowers. And um, I'm, I just started out experimenting with jade carpet sage because it's a black sage, and black sage is actually locally native. So, but you definitely have a, a home run with that Selvia Mrs. Beard there if you've got a hot, dry area that you need a ground cover. And then moving to grasses. I don't have grasses but I, in my garden, but I, I didn't need a lawn. But um, Paula Mira's house and park does need a lawn because they've got kids running around there and, and, and adults walking through, admiring their garden. And so Susan Jackson Lee has planted Carex fragacillus as a lawn substitute, she, they took out the lawn, and so it's very low, low water, um, and and it it makes for it's it's still filling in there, but you can see what a nice looking lawn it's going to become. It already looks great, has kind of a nice prairie look to it. And the other one, I again, I haven't don't have actual experience. That's why I took Susan's photo. I did. I did have deer grass in one of my gardens and that makes for a great tall or ornamental grass. If you love that look of when the wind is blowing through the, the grass leaves or the grass, it, it's an awesome one too. But it's not, it's not one you can walk on. Moving on to succulents. Um, yes, there are California native succulents. Think of Joshua trees and yuccas. There's a yucca that's native to, 
to, to Fallbrook. And I, I just want to show you calscape.org. And I, I type, I pulled up their succulents list just so that you can see if you have a succulent garden you want to add to it, or you want to start in that direction. Calscape can help you definitely more than I can because I'm not I'm not growing these. I just wanted you to know they're available. And then let's get into the uh, the how to of it. Very similar to traditional, I want to call it traditional outdated gardening. Um, you you think about what you want the space to do. Uh, you want. Do you want to have a combination of native and vegetable garden? You want a shady place to gather? Um, maybe you're doing a lawn replacement like they're doing at Palomares House, pollinator garden. So you start there and then you get into plant selection. And I just wanted to show you how nicely the native plants in my garden can go. So on the right side of that photo is my vegetable garden and you can see this zucchini squash leaves in the front and a, and a grape in the back. And then on the left side, you can see the beautiful pink penstemon and monkey flower blooming. And the fact that I'm watering the vegetables a lot and not in the, the native plants, zip zero, nada, is not a problem. Then once, once you've got your objectives, um, you can think about your approach and how much of your time you want to spend on the project. Um, you have the option of getting a, 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 a landscaper to do the whole thing. And, and just the least I wrote real native landscapers, there's people who don't understand what native plants are and they'll tell you they know about native plants and they really don't. So start by checking their plant lists and making sure they're on Kelscape because the, the, some people have a very unusual idea of what a native plant is, like kangaroo, kangaroo paw, which is actually native to Australia. So that's one option. Uh, um, Tree of Life and also Kelscape can help you with plant design. Tree of Life services custom, um, and they, they can give you a plant list that you, you and they assess your area and your needs and they can give you a plant list and, and a diagram of where you want to plant them and then you or your gardener can do the planting. Um, Calscape has a less customized version of that on their website too. That's a great place to get plant lists. If, or if you're like me and you're nerdy and you love a plant, plant geek, um, then you can, you can do your own plan and layout and have your gardeners implement. Or if you're just planting a few plants, you can always do everything yourself. That's just to give you an idea of, of how to get this, how, how you can, different ways you can approach it. And then on the right there, um, that's my garden when, when, when the beautiful Matilla hot poppies and woolly blue curlers and curls and are blooming in the spring. And the actually the Matilla hot poppies are still blooming a bit now. So after you um, come up with your approach, then you choose your plants of layout. And it, the, the process is very similar to traditional gardening. You wanna consider sunlight, how big the plant's gonna grow, moisture needs. You don't wanna put riparian plants in your mix, uh, soil, they make sure that, basically with native plants, the saying is if you can grow weeds, you can grow native plants. So soil isn't too big of an issue. But if you have a slow draining clay type soil, you, you've got to be careful. If you've got, got a really fast draining type soil, like a lot of fall book does, then most, most of these plants will do really well. Most of them want fast draining soil. And then I just put a highlight by reproductive value to the food web of life because that's the new consideration, something we, we didn't do in traditional gardening. <laughs> and we can do now. And all of this is on kelscape.org. You, you find the plant in there and you can read all, all kinds of information on it and even get several pictures of it in the wild.
And, the, and then some of you may have planted annuals and saw how they turn brown. So there's a 75-25 rule that if you want, so some people will say at Garner's and I've gotten this is that, well, uh, Golden Hills in California is the seasonal look. I mean, that's what our, our that's our seasons and the other and um, but I would I would say, yeah, but oak trees stay green all the time. There's, so some people, if you want it green in the heat the, in the summertime, choose 75% evergreen tree shrubs like oak, coffee, berry, you know, this free montedendrum evergreen current. And that way you'll have large green in your garden all year round. Like my hillside's always green because I planted um, these large evergreens. I made the mistake of not doing it, but now I've gone back to put them in. So it's better to put them in at the beginning. And then you choose those pretty flowering plants to give you pops of color through, through most of the year. And that way you've got your green base and your, if you're into having flowers like I am, then you can in, put the, the, the perennials and annuals at the borders to give you the color. And that Greg Rubin, again, who I totally respect and admire, it, it was his idea and the way he does most of his landscaping. And then, ah, when to plant. The, so the reason Joy and I scheduled this presentation at the end of August is that rainy season, especially early reading season in October and even late September is the best time to plant these plants because they like to establish their roots and moist soil. And, and also you won't have, it won't, it'll reduce your need to water them because they are water hungry in the winter. And you may need to water them if we get one of those six and a half inches of rain like we did in the 22 season. Um, last season, I lost plants in the 22 rain because I didn't water them. I watered them once and, and kind of got busy and ignored them. But in the 23 season, I didn't lose anything because of all that. We got, we got rain to take care of them. But what you can do to make sure you don't lose your plants is, is watch them and water them once a week if you don't get rain. And how to plant, um, it's very similar to when we do our regular gardening, but no fertilizers, no compost, don't, don't put a soil amendment in like bone meal, because these guys like their, the, the low nutrient soil that's already there. Um, they, these other things can actually kill some of the plants because it's too rich, like I would call it too rich of a diet for them. <clears throat> So um, basically it's like, uh, the rest of it's like other plant, you water the plant in the pot the day before, ideally. You dig the hole twice as wide and about a half inch less deep. Fill the hole with water, because again, you, when you, these roots are coming out of the pot, so they want, it, they want water. Um, if you live in an area like mine where there's gophers, you want to put a gopher cage in the hole and then put the, or put the pot in the gopher cage and then put them both in the hole. And, and then you want to water again in the last water and, and tamping down the soil is to get out air pockets. And you can mulch. I mulch some of mine and a lot of them on the hillside. I didn't want to spend money on mulch, so I didn't mulch them. And eventually they will produce their own mulch. One thing to watch out for is um, Argentine ants, and those are the ants that come into your house when it's dry and, and in this hot in summer, those little ants that make a parade in your house. Um, if you see those in your, your native plant or even in your regular garden, I've been controlling them. I, I do have somebody who sprays near the house, but then far away from my house, I use, I use ant, ant baits. So don't let those take over your native plants because they will, they they will, they can bring pathogens and kill kill your plant. They can do that with any plant. 
um, on, on to where to purchase. Um, we have a treasure here in San Diego County with Musa Creek. You can go online, pick out their plants, pick out the plants you want, order them, and Musa Creek will deliver to Fallbrook Grand Jettos where you can pick them up and pay for them. And if there's a plant you decide, change your mind about or don't want, you don't have to pay for that one. So you could just take the ones you want and you get to see them ahead of time. And then there's Neil's Nursery. They'll deliver hundred, they'll deliver one plant for eight dollars or up to you know hundreds of them. I've um, I've probably ordered 20 or 30 at a batch from them because I want to make their travel from San Diego up to Fallbrook worthwhile. So I've when I buy plants from them just out of consideration, I like to make sure I have a big place, a big order. Um, so those are local. Las, Las Palitas is um, more on, the, it's north of Santa Barbara. And so they're, they, they've been in this business a long time and they'll charge you a shipping, a, 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 I don't know what to call it, a packaging fee. And then you have to pay for UPS delivery. So to make that cost effective, you want a big order. Wings of Change is our, our local um, group that helps you if you wanna build a butterfly garden. Um, and then if you like to do in-person shopping, tree, I, I, I wanna visit Tree of Life Nursery because they have beautiful grounds where you can see the plants. Um, and, and they're they're near San, it's a bit of a schlep, they're near San Juan Capistrano, but people have told me it's worth the visit just to see the beautiful grounds. And finally, Grand Jettos frequently has a selection of native plants right in front of their store, a small selection. And if you want something more, you can always get it through Musa Creek. So again, I didn't notice I didn't look, list any regular nurseries or I didn't list Home Depot or Lowe's because they, they just don't, they might occasionally have one plant in their stock. And then Native Seeds Grand Generals has a limited selection, but these are best purchased online. Um, and Theodore Payne has a lot of resources on how to plant them. Most, most of them, you just put them in the ground in the winter season impress it into the moist soil, but some of them are a little pickier than that. Um, and then I've been, a, so my one major information, I'm going on to information. So if you want to learn more, um, Cal, and you, basically for planting purposes, you'll want to go to Calscape, the one on the top there, calscape.org. Um, to to get an online guide to the native plant in terms of how much sun it needs, how big it gets, and then and its value to the food food chain. Uh, Las Palitas has great photos of the full grown native plants when they're when when they're pretty well taken care of. Uh, Calscape's photos tend to have them in the wild, and they. They often look better in your garden if you're paying, doing some pr light pruning and things. A Tree and Life Nursery has great how-to videos. Um, the California Native Plant Society has a garden tour in springtime for ideas. And then um, if you, if you want to su support any, a group that'll, a knowledgeable group that'll answer questions and also they post pictures of their gardens, the Southern California Native Plant Gardeners on Facebook. I, I have found them very helpful when I had questions about my plants. Um, then books, if you if you want to buy one book, get this one on the far left, California Native Landscaping, because it's written by Greg Rubin, who does the native plant landscaping in the San Diego area, including Fallbrook. Um, then Nature's Best Hope talks about why we need native plants. Um, the book on the book in the middle there is one that is is kind of like the Western Garden Guide for Native Plants. Calscape is too. So you really don't need these books. I found Greg's Rubin's book useful for inspiration, but these are helpful. 
um, sometimes they give you information that Cal State doesn't have. Um, the next one is what, how to do maintenance and it has a month by month guide, which makes it a little easier. And then the last one is if you've gone on a hike and you've seen a beautiful um, plant grouping and you want your garden to look like an oak forest or a chaparral community, the book talks about how to, how to landscape in that way. And I'm, I'm at the end here um, and I just wanted to, to leave you with so Doug Ptolemy is the one who, who has been sounding amongst other people. Uh, uh, there's other people, but sounding the need for more native plants in our gardens. He, his background is in entomology. Um, and he wrote, in the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now they have to support light, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. And of course, native plants are the best plants to do that. And if you do create, what he's doing at this homegrown national park website is he's tracking across the US how, how many of us are, are putting in native gardens so he can see how much progress we're making towards this, this type of conservation work done in our own backyards. Okay, so now let, let's get unmuted and and um, for questions, if anybody has any. I'll ask a question. Oh, go ahead. There you go. This is Scotty Lloyd, Fall Book. Just out of curiosity, because of the changes in weather currently, is that impacting in some ways for the choices of uh, the pre-European native plants? Um, I, I've only seen a lim little bit of research on it and some people are advocating for, so like for planting plants that are from more inland than where we currently are because our climate's getting hotter, like more inland California. But basically, um, in your garden, there's a there's seven thousand plants to choose from. So even if the climate changes in your garden, you'll still be able to find something. Thank you. And I, I in my garden, I have a mix. I have a mix of chaparral, oak, woodland and um, coastal sage scrub. I, I've got them all together and they don't seem to mind um, because I'm, I'm, I'm not doing restoration work. I'm just trying to have a garden. <laughs> and, and, and I know, I, I imagine if I could make it like it was in the past, um, it might be more successful for the, for the um, wildlife. But even doing this, I'm seeing unusual bees and um, butterflies in my garden that I didn't see before. Susan, leave us ask your question. Um, I, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to make a comment and invite anyone who would like to see these plants in person to the Palomares House. It's the headquarters of the Fallbrook Land Conservancy. We're a nonprofit that protects open space. A lot of you are members. Um, and uh, of course, at our preserves, you can see the native plants in their native habitat and what they look like in the wild, but the Palomares House is um, a demonstration garden that um, we installed, and I um, uh, I did not do it single-handedly. I had a lot of help from some of you all and uh, some Marines and Rotary to install that garden, uh, but it has easy-to-grow native plants, a lot of the ones that Rosalie mentioned, um, the Ceanothus and uh, Cleveland sage and oaks and um, other very easy to grow native plants and you're welcome to come anytime during daylight hours and walk around and enjoy the gardens and um, take a look at and get ideas and on our website is a whole list of all the plants that are planted there. It's a little dry right now because it's the end of summer, 
Um, the picture you saw was obviously from uh, our beautiful lush spring that we had this year, but there's there's always something blooming and uh, next spring should be beautiful too. And those plants there are only uh, just a little over a year old. So you can see how fast they fill in and how quickly they mature when they're in the right conditions. Thanks, Rosalie, that was a great talk. Thanks. Rosalie, I wanted to ask you about vegetable gardening. Do you, how, how does, how do you do your vegetable gardening in relation to native plants? Oh, I, I found that um, on my hillside, I have a row of vegetables and then right down below it, a row of native plants. And I have native plants above it and the ones above, because I, I was wondering, I was concerned that the ones below it might be getting too much water from water running off from my vegetable garden. But that hasn't been a problem um, because the ones, the, the native plants below my veg garden don't look any different than the native plants above. Seems to be. Um, the water the water hasn't been a problem because most native plants don't like summer water it, it, the heat plus that it creates pathogens and some of the pathogens are foreign and the plants aren't set up to cope with a lot of them so yeah it worked it worked it's been working out quite well for me i guess what i meant is whether you can plant native vegetables oh i have i have tried some and let yes there are some that's a great idea and i've been i tried some and i found there just a lot of work to to eat and harvest so one that one that you can do is bladder pot and you can eat the eat the flowers but you've got to boil them a long time i've read i you can eat the seeds i'm not as sure about that i mean i have i've sauteed them um but i i um i haven't been as successful with that but it's a great idea it would it um i was trying to think of I, I oh the other one you can do is um, the people recommend black sage instead of uh, buying the French sage at, at the store buying the black sage because you can use that in, in place of the regular the it's real they call it French sage or garden sage in your cooking and especially at Thanksgiving um, any you, you need less it's a stronger thing so you don't need as much. I've cooked with my native sage too. And my oak trees, in terms of other food, I've had the black walnuts from my tree. And, but my, my oaks seem too young. They haven't produced any acorns yet because I'd be crazy enough to try and process the acorns, but I haven't gotten any yet. <laughs> it's a lot of work to process the acorns. That's why I'm saying that. Are the black walnuts really good? I mean, some of the native nuts are edible, but uh, but they're not really like good tasting. Um, um, so. it's, well, I think my tree has, I've had black walnuts from Whole Foods and they have a, a more tannin taste, but I like it. I like it, it's an earthier taste. Um, my black walnut tastes more like English walnuts. So I'm wondering if it's a hybrid. I, I just, there's no way to know, you know, without having some kind of genetic test done on it, which I, I don't even know if one can do that. But I've had the real, the real ones and I enjoyed them. Any other questions? Deanna had a question on the chat. Deanna, do you want to say that out loud?
or I'll read it. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, since we live in an area with which is high, has high fire risk, and we have a couple of acres, we have avocado trees, and we have some really steep hillsides, and we need to plant plants that are fire resistant. And you did mention there are a lot of uh, natives that are, and and would the calscape be a good resource for uh, helping design a hillside or is it something we can just I for something like that I would I would go directly to Greg Rubin because he has done that and he has worked with the Navy on fire safe landscaping okay I, I can't recall if if Calscape has a list of fire resistant I, I, I Las Politas does but I'd still talk to Greg about that because he does recommend watering those once a month. Okay. And also what about natives that can be used close to your house? Cause there's a height limit for the plants that you can use within, I think, is it first five feet and then it yeah. goes 10 feet? Um, Greg stopped planting, but I, I plant close to my house. Um, but I, I'm in an, I mean, we have a fire hydrant right down the street. So maybe, but any, Greg doesn't plant in that area. He has in the past. And I think the most amazing thing about all his plantings is none of, none of them, none of the land burned. And there are areas where the, the house he planted with natives is surrounded by, by burnt out hillsides. And he'd be a really good person to talk to about that. Okay, great, great. Thank you. I'm I'm in a more suburban, I'm sort of more suburban here, so I'm not as maybe I should be more concerned, but I'm not quite as concerned as I would be if I was further out. <laughs> but they are they are fire resistant. There's a lot of ones that are fire resistant, so he can help you there too. Okay, great. I see Susan Levis has put a URL up on the chat called vegetariat.com. Do you want to explain that, Susan? That's the links. Uh, Harriet um, recommended Diane Kennedy, who I agree is an amazing resource. Oh. And that's her the link to her website, which is Finch Frolic Permaculture Garden. And she does tours and is a wealth of knowledge. And that's... Um, her website has a blog on it, so you can read through that and learn a lot. Okay. One of the things that's on Diane's website, vegetariat.com, is a recipe for how to make your own ant traps. Because I had a bunch of those horrible Argentinian ants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and of course, I'm just kind of going, well, they're ants. I mean, aren't they part of the ecosystem? Shouldn't we like respect them and keep them? There? And Diane kind of went, no. And she she has a recipe for uh, you take a, a, a glass, like a spice jar or something like that. And you soak um, you soak cotton balls in borax, which is a horrible thing. You should never, ever use it. But if you have a borax solution and you soak, soak the cotton balls in it, and then put them in the spice jar with with the holes in the top so that the ants can get in and out and um and you put in some sugar with the borax to to trick them into uh, <laughs> taking taking this borax sugar solution back to their uh back to their nests and um uh and and it it, it really worked very well i mean i had basically a lot of ants and i put all of these i i actually got jars from the dollar store that were like cheese shakers you know the kind that that you see on restaurant uh, italian restaurant tables they're kind of glass they're they're maybe uh three or four inches tall and they've got a little cap that's got lots of holes and it, it worked like a charm it was great oh great great susan jackson had it 
notice for us about the Native Plant Society. Did you want to explain that, Susan? Are you still here? Maybe she had to leave. I, I know. I, I see. Are the, you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Well, they're having a plant to say the Native Plant Society is having their annual sale at Liberty Station this year. They usually have it at Casa del Prado. And it's a big sale. A lot of people go and um, you can join the California Native Plant Society if you want, or you can just buy plants. They have hundreds and hundreds of plants for sale. And it, a lot of people go and it's a good source. And that's October 14th, Saturday. Or is that Sunday? I don't know. Whatever October 14th. It, go to their website, the California Native Plant Society, San Diego, and they'll have all the details on how to get there and so forth. The 14th That's is awesome. a Saturday. Yeah, it's a Saturday. Okay. They also have, I, I think I might have listed them as a source of seeds. They also have a seed program you can find on their website. And uh, the Fallbrook, what are they called? Fall, Fallbrook Conservation District is beginning to start a seed exchange, but it, I don't, it's not up yet, but that's something to keep an eye on because then you'll be able to get free seeds, which is always nice. They have the seeds at the plant sale as well. They have a big, big tables with seed packets for sale. Oh, oh great. Rosalie, I've always started, I've always bought the plants from Musa, Musa Creek mostly, um, for like the pen, uh, the, the, the Ceanothus and some others. And someone put in the chat that they were going to uh, start things from seeds. Uh, it, I mean, is it just slower? Can you plant Ceanothus and, and some of these, uh, I mean, the monkey flowers and uh, um, I, I've just gotten them in pots. It, maybe that's just a, a quicker way, or can you actually start hey. from seeds? Definitely quicker to get them in pots, um, and I, I don't, I, what do I want to say? Monkey flowers grows easy from seeds because I have it seeding itself in my garden, and I, as a volunteer plant, so that one I know. I think Cianotus grows better from cuttings. There's a, a native plant propagation Facebook page where you can ask about that, and then. Um, I think Judith, I Judith Lerner has a book out, but I, I can't tell you more about it. But definitely, um, with seeds, before you just put buy them, find out how easy they are, because I think Cianotis is difficult to start from seed. Another one, woolly blue curls and um, Matilla hot poppies. You actually have to do a pre-treatment to get the seeds to work. So um, find, you know, find out how much effort you have to put into the seed. I don't, and the, like I said, the CNLs, I think even the nurseries start those from cuttings. I don't want to discourage you though, because California poppies and Clarkia um, and monkey flower grow easy from seeds. And I basically put the seeds in the ground on the ground spread around and rubbed them in with my hand and they started sprouting. So I, I don't want to discourage you from trying seeds for, for, for most of them. Also native milkweed, once you get a few plants, I got a couple of plants in pots and now they're all over my yard. They've self-seeded everywhere, which is fabulous. I have butterflies up the up the yin yang because because they've, it's oh. self but I, I don't know if you could get, I, I don't know if they have native, native milkweed seeds that are available. Oh, they do. They do, especially I know Theodore Payne has some. And it's listed on my seed list. Yeah, yeah, those milkweed seeds are, are available and Theodore Payne definitely has them. <clears throat> Rosalie, would, would you, do you wanna explain about the, your PDF file that you're making available to people? Oh, great, yeah. I. 
if you if you saw a plant you liked or you you want to have this as a resource document, um, I I made a PDF file and I'm easy to contact on Facebook Messenger under my name Rosalie Vito. You go into Facebook because that's the thing I monitor. I don't check my emails often enough, um, so Facebook Messenger is a good place to reach me if you if you want a PDF of this deck, and if you're not on Facebook. Um, Contact Joy Fru because she also has it. But and I, I'm on Gmail. I, yeah. And, Joy and, Fru at gmail.com. And Joy yeah, or, or you can just reply to one of the emails that we send out if you um, get on our mailing list. If you're new or if you're already on it, you can always just reply to our e one of our emails about what you're requesting and we can get that to you right and and with me too if you have if you're trying to pick out plants um or need some suggestions again contact me on facebook messenger i i have be happy to share my experience in my garden if you have questions like that too and i'm free they always have something to say about free advice but, but I have knowledge from my, I've been gardening a long time and, and from my own experience in the garden, I can share with you with, with the plants that are working really well and thriving here in Fallbrook. If there's nothing else, if nobody else has any questions, we'll, we'll just um, stop the meeting. Great. Yeah, thank you, it was wonderful. Great thank job, you, Rosalie. Rosalie, it was great. Oh, great. Glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> That's great.